Right. So, hi guys. I'm Jonathan Miller Gravetz. I'm a data analyst on our customer support team, the DCL, as many of you have been hearing throughout Join. Um, this deep dive is going to be to use or not use PDT. So if you're supposed to be somewhere else, now would be a good time to be there, OK? Awesome. So we're going to dive in. So what we're going to cover today is why we derive and persist. To give some background, just some brief introduction to derive tables, types of derived tables, when to use them, of course, what to look out for. And don't worry, they're going to get worse from here, guys, so just bear with me, OK? When to move to an ETL, OK? And this really, this talk at a high level is really about that. Why we build derived tables, and then when is it time to actually migrate them over to the ETL? The balancing act of all of this, and I'd like to end with some development best practices in Looker that some of you may be familiar with, um, but I'd like to bring up. So why do we derive and persist? What is a derived table? A derived table is a SQL query that defines a set of business logic. It returns a reduced amount of data, Okay, and it can include complex calculations and data transformations. Persistence, in the case of today, we're going to be looking at caching data, or really the data survival, after its creation process is terminated. So some examples of persistence is when we go to a web app and we're filling out a form, and I go do something else, and I come back to the web app, and ah, all my data is there. The form's still filled out. I can start completing it till the end. I don't have to start over from the beginning. Another example of this would be many of you are in embed case, so you're caching large quantities of complex analyses to an end user, and they need to access that right away. And really, what this is in Looker as a whole is just ensuring that the data is ready for the analysis. And I want to keep in mind something that I think we as analysts, we focus on the problem, we're able to break it apart, but there's really an end user here. And that end user could be someone in the public. It could be another data analyst or it could be a team of analysts. It could be engineers. So really keeping in mind who that end user is is something that we want to keep, uh, that we want to do for um, the remainder of this presentation. So we've got two types of derived tables in Looker. And I know your heads are filled with acronyms, and of course the two I'm going to give you today are going to rhyme to make it fun. So we've got ephemeral derived tables, or EDTs, okay? And they generally start with a with clause. I know MySQL is a little different. Um, and I'll explain the difference between the two in just a second. We also have persistent derived tables, or PDTs. Also, as Lloyd mentioned this morning, there are, is now native derived tables. Now, native derived tables are still both of these. So I want to make that very clear. They are just a different syntax for being able to create them. So you write that in LookML with less SQL versus writing all the SQL out. So what's the difference between these two things? EDTs build at runtime of the query every time. PDTs build by triggering and or persisting. And I know that data groups were mentioned, so I'm going to come back to PDTs when we get to that section and kind of talk about the nuances there. So when do we do this? Why do we build a derived table? Well, we've got historical summaries, entity and transaction tables, rollups, also aggregations. I've kind of heard those terms used synonymously and to overcome SQL structural limitations. Those are things like window functions. Those are also things like correlated or nested you know, uh, subqueries. So if you get nested aggregates, right, that's not a valid SQL statement. We need to build a subquery to overcome that. So let's start with EDTs, OK? When do we build an EDT instead of a PDT? When the view is quick to run, OK? It doesn't involve needing to have it ready. It's quick to run. When the view should include real-time data. When it should be dynamically built based off of user filter inputs. This is something that we see on chat all of the time. I come on, OK, someone call, calls me, or they chat in, they go, hey, I uh, have this templated filter in a persistent derived table. Sorry, it's not going to work. We got to move that to an ephemeral derived table, OK? Because it requires that filter input to use that build. If you omit the filter input, it will still create a true statement and build that table. Whereas persistence is triggered not by user input. It's triggered by this value that we set. And also when it needs to be dynamic, but the number of permutations are manageable. Okay? And this would be something like user attributes, for instance. Okay? That's something that we can use to dynamically build these tables as well. So I was talking with my colleague, Maxi Corbin, who did a uh, talk earlier in the day. 
And I love that she's just so blunt about some of these topics. And for me, this was a great quote that she actually said and was just so wonderful. So I love ephemeral derived tables because they feel lightweight and focused. But they make most sense when you're doing something small, quick, and or if what you're doing, uh, or in agile, and or if what you're doing is sensitive to frequent ETL. If you don't mind doing the, or if you don't mind the computation cost and redoing the computation each time, then I'd say don't persist. So that's always a great starting place. But sometimes we find that this drive table takes a long time to run. So if we're trying to build it every time at runtime, it's not going to work for our end user. So when should we build a PDT? Data freshness requirements are something that we always should consider here. If we're doing yearly analysis over the last, let's say, 50 years, is today's data, having the most you know, essential data for today, going to help that analysis? Probably not. That's probably a different analysis we want to do. Whereas at a yearly scope, we want to persist that um, so we can you know, quickly access all of that data at one time. So another big one is the available database resources and this ratio to resources consumed by the build. We see this constantly as well. Uh, my queries aren't working. OK, what's going on? Well, when we run them, we're getting a timeout, or we're getting a table lock, or something like this. And you're like, what? so we dive in. We look at the queries panel. There's this PDT that's been building for three hours. right? They're at, in, they're at their annual, or they're at their kind of weekly meeting check-in for this stuff. And the rest of the queries are just halted. And so knowing your database, knowing what limitations it has, and really looking at optimizing this full system is kind of what we'll move into here in a sec. So how do we then persist? Well, it used to be that we would define persist for or a SQL trigger value for these builds. Now we've got data groups. And we're going to be saying that a lot. I know you, some of you saw that today. It's allowing you to set a caching policy. You get the best of both worlds of persist for and SQL trigger value. And you can also set a cache age for these to be broken. You guessed it. What to look out for. So PDTs are powerful, but we want to stress something to you guys. They are not the end all solution in many cases. They are not the perfect solution. So being aware of what the front end user experience is going to be is something that we want to take in mind here. Computational resources, I know I touched on that. And available database resources. So that's both database time, the amount of time it takes to process something, as well as your time when you have to come and troubleshoot the query queue and cancel all these things because right, it's all backed up. And if you're a big query user, that could also be actual money because the quantity of data that you're running actually charges for that. So this is a funny meme that, well, it's funny to me. Whether, you, whether or not you think it is, I'll leave it up to you. But for me, it's like, how, you know, this is our meeting. It's our weekly meeting. It's our check-in. We've got an hour to do this, to sync up with everyone across the world. And we've got, how has your retention rate changed? How much, oh, none of the, none of the queries are working. A uh, SQL error, a uh, table lock, and then the lead analyst is like, yeah. Has anyone had a table lock situation before in here? Oh, look at this. No one ever, right? Or we don't want to admit it, of course, of course. So <laughs> when then should a PDT be part of the ETL? And really what it comes down to is a couple main pieces here. There's probably some others, but I wanted to touch on the main pieces. One is if you have a powerful ETL tool that you can leverage, OK? Sometimes you don't. So you can use Looker as an interim until whether you're ready for that or to see how that behaves. But please note that this is, Looker is one piece of this big pipeline that we put together. When the PDT's logic is well understood and consistently being used. My favorite chats are the ones where they come on and they're like, OK, well, we're using extends and we have sales 1, sales 2, and sales 3. OK, well, I'm going to tell you more. Then we've got sales 1.2 and 1.3 and 1.4. And you're like, OK, I'm, I, I'm lost. Like, let's back up a step here. What, what are we doing? What is the point of this? Like, how do I even know what we're diving in? And also, we're talking about scaling data to other parts of your organization. If you label them or if we organize them in a certain fashion, the interpretability of them improves greatly, and so someone can quickly and easily pick them up and actually understand what's going on. And the table lock situation is when a PDT is being used outside of Looker. If it's being used outside of Looker, then move that query outside of Looker. And the reason for this is that Looker acts as its own user, right? As we set up our connections, we define a user on our database. It's running checks. It's running to see when caches should be broken. It's running uh, create tables, drop tables, rename, right? It's doing all of this. And so if simultaneously you try to ping that same table, 
as the Looker user is doing that, you can cause this table lock, and your database is smart. So it'll be like, hey, sorry, uh, you know, don't proceed. You can still like, get around this. You, know, you can still figure your data's not lost, but I'm going to shut down. And really, when the, ET, the naming of the ETL table clearly communicates its content. Okay, and that's something I want to continue to bring up about this organizational part, about being clear. So this is a little diagram that just kind of shows where Looker fits in this process. And you can see that it's very in a very iterative process. And I was talking to some of the people on our team, our product team, and just talking about where they see this going. We're at a time where we start iterating and developing more often. We're constantly asking new questions, and we want the ability to be agile, but also have stability when we need it. So Looker fits into this loop where you can extract, right, the E part. You can transform and date the data in Looker, and you can do that kind of iteration without sending that drive table to the end user as you prototype. So what do we do? How do we move it? Well, good luck. Um, just kidding. So you already have the SQL. It's really straightforward. You have the SQL, and LookML provides uh, models across dialects. So you move it to a database. And now after we've seen with Looker 5, if it's in two different databases, boom, you can stitch it together on the front end. So what it comes down to is this balancing act. Okay? It's a pragmatic balance between flexibility and reliability. Where few PDTs are flexible, but many PDTs can be unreliable. So we think of, I have this problem that I'm trying to overcome, and it merits building a derived table. So I build it, okay? Wow, it takes a while to build, then I persist it. Well, I still need parts of it to be, you know, uh, update manually based off of filter input, okay? Or, or dynamically based off of filter input. Okay, so now I need maybe another EDT, okay? So then we have all of this building and building, we get more derived tables and more persistent derived tables, and all of a sudden, trying to figure out a schedule of when those should build, if they should build overnight, if they should build during the day, whatever, becomes very complicated and unreliable. And then it backs up that database load. On the other hand, you have reliability with the ETL. But it's not as straightforward to all of a sudden do ad hoc analysis or create you know, a PDT that's going to overcome that SQL structural limitation or whatever it is. So this is really the balancing act that we go through here. So I want to get into some development best practices within Looker. And the first, and I'm going to continue to bring it back to this, is use consistent naming conventions. I get chats all the time where we're like, OK, we're looking through. There's not, it's not very clear. It doesn't look like there's any development guidelines. Um, and one thing that we see all the time is I want to join this table back in. Have you considered primary keys? Because you're going to be dealing with symmetric aggregates here. And so can you easily define one of these? If you're grouping by a field, you can call that, and that's the only field you're grouping by, that will be your primary key. If you have multiple fields you're grouping on, a lot of times you can compound those to create a compound primary key. We have development guidelines, right? Many people have heard this for engineering. Well, now we're looking at a code base for analysts. And this is something that we uh, strive to do at Looker and actually do within our team. Iterative development. I love the chats that start off with a SQL block of a thousand lines. No hello, no hi, how's it going? <laughs> Just here's a thousand lines. And, and I'm trying to figure out, OK, like where do we start? Now, if you give me a paren, if one of those little parens is sneaky, right, and he's hunting and he's running off to the side, I can help with that pretty quickly. I've got some methods and tools to do that. But when you're like, yeah, the data's not right. Uh, OK, guys, <laughs> the data's not right. OK, well, what are we going to do? How do we problem solve this? You know the first thing I do? I comment all of those lines out, and I send you the first thing that's going to be calculated. OK, does this run? Let's see if it runs in SQL Runner. Does it? Yes. Is the data correct? No. Well, here's one problem. OK, let's look at the next part that it does. And so all of a sudden, we take something that could have been done in iteration when through testing, and we don't plan for this. And what happens, it takes a lot of our time to debug. You have to come to us, which I love. I want to stress that. I'm happy to sit and comment out code all day. That's fine. By all means, please send it over. But just note that this could have been done in a more efficient way, and we could have planned for this. So this touches on you know, test the SQL as you go. 
right? Test that block, see how it behaves. Cool, this works, I like this, let's keep this. Okay, now let's build the next part here. Let's test that, let's see how it runs and continue this. And for those of you that love to validate, I don't know, once a year and you click and all of a sudden you're like, there's 188 LookML errors and we're like, okay, let's start with the first one. Just so you know, this is gonna be a long chat, okay? Sometimes I say that, like, we're gonna be here for the next eight hours, so just, you know, make sure you've got your cup of tea and everything else that we're gonna do here. Um, so that's just another one. Changing and pushing to prod is a big one, where this is just a little, like, how it works, and so I wanna make sure that this is clear. If you can build your table in development mode, do it there. The reason is, is because as soon as you make changes in the code, whether it's a data group change, whether it's a change to the SQL, Looker now recognizes that as a completely new table, and it will force a build when that code makes its way onto production. If, however, you build it in development mode, then when you push that code, it will promote the table that's built in dev mode. And some file and code structure. So we've got horizontal versus vertical, and I'll dive into that right now. So, right, we have a thousand tables. So already trying to just find one of the tables is kind of a nightmare. And how do we make this clear? Well, those tables have specific uses. And so what we can do actually is we can prefix each view name with a certain you know, keyword that basically groups these files together. So if they're all for your marketing team, maybe put mkt dot whatever the file name is. And the reason for this is that number one, the sort of those view files will all be based on that and so it will group them together. And the second thing is that when you include those files in a model, or you're doing extends, right, we're extending models or something like that, trying to track down where the include is going into all these files can be hard and take time. Whereas if we use a wildcard that you can kind of, is it coming through up here? Yeah, okay, it's just my angle. Where if you use a wildcard, you can actually call all of those files at one time. In vertical, I'm gonna kinda go through a couple of these. This is really just a ephemeral drive table that I built that all it's doing is it's looking at the total amount of usage of all customers and how that compares to each customer. So how much usage to the total usage has each customer done? And what this does is it modularizes my code and makes it very clear as to what section does what thing, okay? What block of the SQL actually does. And so what we can do is define, believe it or not, multiple views in a single view. Did everyone know you could do that? Yeah, okay, totally, perfect. So, what we do next is we look at building out that sum of usage in minutes for each customer and their email. We then do that inner join, and ultimately what we're looking for in this particular example is we do a cross join where we then can compare each one of these views that are in a single view file. And so, for instance, the view file would be view, and what we have as a development best practice is that if this is a standalone view, it is not being joined back into the model. This should never make its way to the end user or only developers or analysts who have developer permission should um, use it. Then we build us an explore at the bottom of that file that's hidden. And so our model file stays very clean. That's where the model is. That's where the, it, the, um, the code lives for the rest of our end users. But for us, we know that this means that this is a standalone view we use internally. So at a high level, when to use and kind of a takeaway at the end, we've got EDTs, real-time data, quick, uh, quick query or quick to run, dynamically built. We've got PDT data freshness, available database resources, uh, prototyping, ETL, powerful ETL tool, well understood PDT, consistently used and used outside of Looker. All right, thank you guys.